I would like to welcome you all of you to the last uh, panel of this uh, first day today of the retreat 2016. Uh, we are awfully out of time, so we have, and uh, actually, uh, I want to to ask all the participants of the panel to keep it uh, uh, as brief as you can. Actually, the title of the of this uh, third panel is the digital journalism and public interest. Uh, we heard some things. We referred to the public interest notion and the previous panel too as well and uh, to be honest with you um, when I, I I've informed about uh, the title of the panel actually a basic question came up to my mind who defines today what public interest exactly is because having the right to do so or the ability to do so it means that up to a large extent you have also the ability to, uh, to define the general agenda setting in the public communication. That's the, the good old function of agenda setting as well. But nowadays we're witnessing actually uh, skyrocketing popularity of uh, social media on the web and especially the informative role of social media. The citizen journals phenomenon, the new role of uh, professional journals that they have to assume as mediators and moderators of the online conversations the whole, the brand new web reputation is a management system actually. The precise audience analysis in real time through uh, analytic tools, the need of increased collaboration and information exchange within the boundaries of the web actually. The question about the need of regulation or not and how is this, and if this thing is technically uh, efficient actually. And many more of these kind of interesting questions actually that they arise. This panel uh, aims, if not to give answers, at least to contribute in a very productive and fruitful way in this uh, global dialogue about uh, digital journalism and the need to rethink what public interest is and who defines it. And uh, to achieve uh, so, we have the pleasure actually to have with us today three uh, distinguished uh, speakers, three well-known experts of the broader field of communication and uh, communication studies and uh, research. And uh, I would like uh, to, to start with uh, Professor Charlie Beckett from the Department of Communication and Media of the London School of Economics. Uh, he's also the uh, founder director of the think tank Polis and an active blogger himself. And uh, not uh, wanting actually to take more of your time, I would like to welcome Professor, Professor Beckett for his talk. Great, thanks very much. Very nice to be here. Um, very nice to be um, in, in, in a fellow member of the European Union, um, still. Um, Brexit beat Grexit. Um, I'm gonna slightly cheat on this one. I'm gonna try and keep it quick, and I'm gonna, the slides are just gonna be nice big pictures, because I know that you're all very tired. Uh, I'm gonna cheat because I'm gonna be talking not directly about the public interest in the sense that I don't think you can understand the public role uh, of journalism and the news media unless you understand how it's changing. So I'm going to um, try and look at some kind of concepts and trends that I think you have to pay attention to uh, if you care about journalism. And it's really obvious from today that a lot of people here really care about journalism uh, and also care about how much it's changed. So I don't have to talk, I don't think so much about you know, the past um, or the more recent. I'm going to try and look more uh, at the future of news. And this is partly because uh, I've been at the LSE now for 10 years. I'm kind of celebrating a decade in uh, the university. I used to work as a journalist, so it's 10 years uh, since I was in a newsroom, or at least getting paid to be in a newsroom. And, uh, Soon after I joined the LSE, I wrote this book called Super Media, which was a bit like, uh, it was very much inspired by Dan Gilmore, uh, his book, We Media. It was all about this idea of network journalism. And it was published back in 2008, so nearly 10 years ago. And it had lots of ideas about participation, um, about how journalism can be more open and more democratic and why that's a good thing. Um, I, I was saying we should be aspiring to using all these technologies to make better journalism. But the pace of change has been so incredibly fast that the book, um, 
I won't say it was out of date, but it, it came to fulfillment. You know, people started doing the things that I was talking about in the book very, very soon afterwards. Not because they read the book, of course, but because it was a good idea to do it. So this is an attempt to kind of update some of those ideas. Then I wrote a book. Now I will do a BuzzFeed listicle um, because it's a lot quicker and a lot more popular. Um, so these are kind of nine things that I think you need to know about the future of news. And the first one is it's so obvious that we don't even think about it now. But when I was in the newsroom, we used to say things like, uh, shall we cover that story? And somebody else would say, sorry, we can't cover that story because we haven't got any pictures. It was a TV news. We haven't got any pictures, so we can't cover that story. Uh, so there was this scarcity of data, of information, of content. And of course, now, as people have been saying throughout the day, uh, it's the opposite uh, problem, that we've got this abundance. We're, we are kind of drowning in a, a, in, a, a, in a sea of content. And that is not going to stop. We have not reached peak content yet. It's going to, the volume, uh, if anything, is accelerating because social media is exponentially uh, increasing and becoming, as people uh, go online more, as there's more uh, digital penetration, as people live their lives much more through uh, digital and social media, there's going to be even more stuff out there. And that means that the task very much becomes about curation. And the curation will be done by other people if you don't do it as journalists. Uh, other organizations, like where I work, my university is now a media organization. It has social media platforms. It creates content, and it curates content. And of course, then there's the other people, like that company which has been mentioned a lot today, run by Mark Zuckerberg, who are also, although they say they're not a media company, of course they are editing uh, content and they are influencing the way that you get it. So they are curating uh, content. Uh, in English, curation is a word that um, we use for museums. And in that sense, it's a bad word to use because uh, curation, as the previous panel people were talking, has got to be much more active. It's got to be much more like a service that you provide uh, and it is about uh, not just moderating comments it's about uh, engagement community understanding analytics uh, and having a much more of a uh, of a relationship uh, with the uh, user so that's the, the the first shift is this idea to to creation and all the um, the issues that raises in terms of resources people talked about and skills but there is absolutely no choice. If journalists don't curate, then other people will do it, and they'll do it badly. Um, so I think it's really important that we understand that. The second one, um, this is actually an English joke. Anybody know Quality Streets? is an en English sweet. It's a mixed um, tin of different flavors and so on. And the point here is that if you care about the quality of journalism, uh, it doesn't matter whether you believe in kind of cheap commercial stuff or very intelligent, well-made stuff. That's all about quality. But what you have to understand uh, much more is that quality is now blended into people's lives. The old idea that you could have a, a quality newspaper that stood alone and was separate uh, just doesn't work anymore. The, the way that uh, content is distributed through uh, people's, um, usual, uh, often now they're mobile, uh, they're getting their content uh, on the same uh, platforms uh, and in the same place and often at the same time as they get a whole load of other communications about their family, about work, about sport, about entertainment, about business, and then pop in comes the uh, news as well. And the news itself, therefore, has to ad adapt, uh, partly in the way in its style and the way that it uh, communicates to those people to blend the quality into their lives. People live hybrid uh, media lives now, where a, a, an article from the Financial Times will be 
next on their Facebook stream to a picture of a newborn baby or a kitten or something. So quality has to uh, be in that mix in people's lives and has to stand on its, uh, on its merits. Um, the next one is that news is getting, and there's this, this is sort of a series of paradoxes. One of the, you were saying at the beginning, Chair, that we were going to try and come up with answers, or you know, but the, um, I'm coming up with a series of paradoxes in a way, which is, and this first one is that news is getting much, much faster. Uh, and that's really obvious, I think, if you, um, you look at incidents like uh, terrorism, that we know instantly the fact when something happens or somebody says something, you can know about that anywhere in the world instantly. And that's incredibly fast and it creates all sorts of problems about, you know, is it true? Can you verify it? Do we understand it? Um, how important is it? Uh, then anyone who's working in a, in a kind of news uh, organization at the moment uh, understands that. Even if you're not publishing instantly, even if you're still working, for example, on a newspaper which gets published in the morning or the re evening, you, of course, are watching social media and that news is instantly breaking and it's instantly out there and being uh, transported around the world. So news is getting much, much faster. But because, and here's the paradox, because it's instant, everything else, everything else can become slower. Now, of course, people want the context, the background, the follow-up as soon as they can, but there are loads of opportunities now uh, to provide slower news. And again, the internet's marvelous because uh, it doesn't disappear. It's not like a TV news bulletin where your program goes out and then where does it go? Well, it goes onto the internet. Um, so there's loads of opportunities for what I would call slower news. <clears throat> People, for example, longer reads. I think a lot around, we heard about data visualization earlier. People enjoy that taking more time to get more information and are prepared uh, to wait for that to happen. Uh, in fact, it's, um, it's almost a, a kind of relief for people when you've got all this fast, fast news uh, to have the slower news uh, that can follow up and you hope provide more uh, detail, more insight, perhaps even more human interest, you know, going to talk to people about what has just happened. So news is getting faster uh, and it's also getting slower. Another strange one is that news is getting much bigger, uh, but it's also uh, getting smaller. And by this, I mean, in a way, it's a bit like the last point. When you have a big uh, news event, especially uh, a dramatic, uh, live, breaking news story, uh, like a, a terrorist attack, uh, the news event, and you can actually see this on the, the data analytics when you look at viewings or readings or engagement, you can see that um, the, the, the volume of attention being paid is being amplified by social media. So something happens, it goes on Twitter or it goes on the TV, and then, of course, everyone starts talking about it. There may be eyewitnesses, there may be people commenting, and then you're going to have all those expert people, for example, at universities, who then start publishing around that event and so the volume peaks um, uh, and is much higher. But on the other hand, there's a lot more uh, small, smaller news. And this is the idea of the kind of long tail, that people, there is lots of specialist possibilities thanks to the internet. It's much easier, as Chris Anderson describes it, as long tail. If you've got a specialist little bit of knowledge, it could be that you just know about a tiny place, or it could be that you have a very a specialist uh, area of uh, expertise, um, you can now find more people who are going to share that thanks to the internet. And increasingly, people are going to want to pay for that kind of very specialist knowledge. A good example of this would be uh, the Politico website uh, in Brussels, which uh, has very small audiences who are pre prepared to pay a lot because they talk about quite small, very specialist, detailed stories. So I think news is getting bigger and it's getting smaller. Here's a tough one. Um, of course, there's more resource, and as you know only too well in Greece, there's also less. 
um, the less bit is obvious that the money, the easy money from advertising and so on has gone from journalism and we've all got to face up to that because it's not coming back. Uh, the advertising models uh, online just aren't good enough. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have extraordinary uh, resources, not just those incredibly clever data visualizations which can be quite tricky to make, but the phenomenal technologies we've got when you think about mobile, when you think about how you can go live uh, on your mobile um, instead of having to have all those cameras and satellite trucks, uh, when you think about the way that you can uh, automate, and this isn't always popular when you're talking to journalists, but there's a lot of stuff that we used to do that we don't need to do now because you're duplicating information that is easily accessible elsewhere and you're also often uh, creating journalism that could really be done by a piece of software. So there's kind of more resource uh, and at the same time there's less. Another one when I wrote the book back whenever it was I talked a lot about how the fortress of journalism was going to be uh, torn down, that they're going to have to open the, the gates and let the people in, let people participate. Uh, one of the problems with that though, of course, it, it means it can undermine those institutions, you know, the news brands. And now institutions are not very popular at the moment. Generally speaking, the public don't like institutions, they don't like governments, they don't like people in authority. But of course, institutions are very important. Um, news brands, uh, news company, uh, it does things for you as a journalist. It pays you money, you hope, but it can provide legal protection, it can provide training, uh, and also it can pr provide something which is less tangible, which is this idea of a shared intellectual community where you can talk, you know, you can share experience, you can help each other, you can even create inspiration. And that actually is in some ways even more important now because we're facing so much change in journalism. So it's really important that if you're going to innovate, it's often easier to do it um, institutionally. Uh, and of course, if you don't adapt, you die. Uh, but I, I still think that those institutions have to be much more networked. Networked firstly to the public, but also increasingly to other sources of expertise and skill and collaboration. People talked earlier about ProPublica, but not just collaboration with different media organizations, but collaboration with other institutions. So come collaborate with the LSE. The LSE collaborated with the Guardian newspaper on an investigation into uh, the riots in London a few years ago. So in some ways, institutions are still too strong you know, the culture of this is how we've always done it, the resistance to change. In some ways, those institutions are still too strong. They still try to defend uh, their business model as it was, instead of thinking, how can we reinvent ourselves? But at the same time, you're also seeing new institutions coming along, like BuzzFeed. That is an institution. Uh, Vice, that is an institution. And of course, you know, most famously, Facebook, people like that, the platforms, their institutions, and interestingly, uh, those digital native platforms and digital native journalism organizations are having to learn some of the lessons that journalistic institutions learned. Uh, earlier, people talked about the, the Facebook mistake over the Vietnam uh, photo. Well, that was a mistake that was made because they didn't have the institutional knowledge that you hope uh, a, a journalistic newsroom would have had. So again, a paradox about institutions are too weak and too strong. And related to that is this idea that journalism is too open and too closed. I've always argued um, for open journalism, participatory, collaborative, innovative, uh, networked. Um, but in a way, you could say it's too open. If you look at uh, The Guardian, for example, which is perhaps the most famous example of trying to be an open journalism organization. The news for The Guardian is that they lost 50 million pounds last year. Uh, and strategically, uh, I think they, they're in trouble. Um, so in that sense, I think it's, we are seeing that uh, um, journalism is becoming um, less open. 
And that's partly about the idea of creating paywalls or subscription so that you can actually get some payment for the content that you're creating. Um, but I don't think it should be uh, too closed because we are in this world where, as I mentioned at the very beginning, people are getting their news through these uh, social networks, through these distribution. And so if you are not, and I would argue that you do have to, uh, to play with Facebook um, or people like them, uh, that you, it's going to be tough and you may not always get all the money back, uh, but you cannot be uh, too closed. So another kind of paradox. And in the end, of course, it's a choice for each journalist or each news organization to decide to what degree they're going to be open or closed. Uh, the next one um, is this idea of, I mean, I've never really quite understood the uh, Jürgen Habermas's idea of the public sphere, but as I understand it, I think it is dead for all those reasons that I've cited before. The idea of a, a space uh, that media can create a defined uh, space, uh, I don't think holds anymore. Uh, it's too open, it's too networked, um, it's too distributed. But that does not mean that journalism shouldn't think of itself, and this is the title of the panel, as in the public interest. So again, there's a paradox that the public sphere in that old-fashioned idea has gone, but the idea of journalism being self-conscious about being in the public interest and for the public and not just a closed culture, not a profession, but a service, a public service in the same way that you know, the transport system or the health service, I think is absolutely uh, vital. Uh, and finally, just um, so what is this kind of journalism um, in the past? You know, we've talked about how journalism should be critical, it should be independent, uh, it should strive for objectivity in that sense of, you know, let's try and get some facts, let's try and be accurate, let's try and be intelligent. But I think increasingly these, and, and this only works in English, these four C's, I don't know what the Greek words are, um, but are, I think, kind of new ways that journalists have to think. I mean, the curiosity one isn't a new one. Um, but I'm amazed how many people think that being a journalist is a sort of science. No, it's not. You have to absolutely uh, have that drive, that passion, that obsession uh, to find out things. And it sounds obvious, um, but it's remarkable, especially perhaps when you've been a journalist for a while, you become less curious. And this is really important in the social media age because one of the most important drivers of attention, not just traffic, but attention and engagement uh, with your content is curiosity on the part of the audience. People really want to be surprised. They really want to be told stuff they didn't know. They really want to uh, not miss out. They're really curious about what's happening. It's a basic human instinct, but social media is making that appetite even stronger. So we have to be curious as well. Um, the content, obviously, yeah, it's that cliche. Uh, the content is king. Um, but what I mean by that is the content has to be special. It has to be different. Don't go and make lots and lots and lots of OK stuff. I think increasingly you have to make less stuff but make it much, much better so that it stands out uh, and that people will value it much more. So content is still absolutely important. And obviously, as the previous panel was saying, um, you don't just create the content and sit there. You have to work hard at making sure that people are paying attention to it, that when they react to, to it, that you interact with those people, and that content can be moved and shaped uh, and taken on. Uh, critical is, is, is super important. It's a, it's a kind of motto of the LSE. And I, uh, it's one of the reasons I like working there is because I think it's the same value for really, really good journalism. And by critical, I don't just mean nasty or negative. Well, that's fine. Um, I mean that you are thinking uh, independently. You're asking the extra question. You don't just ask the obvious question, but you ask the second, third, fourth question. And you also ask those questions about yourself. 
So it's about being self-critical. Am I being cliched? Am I being prejudiced? Am I doing something that's too obvious? Um, am I right? Those kind of questions, I think, are vital. And the final one, with, well, nearly the final one, uh, is creativity, which, again, we didn't used to talk much about this, especially with news journalism. Um, creativity was seen, that was something that artists did, or actors, or painters, or something. Uh, they were creative, but I think increasingly we've seen you know, some lovely examples already around things like data visualization and so on. But I don't just mean in the terms of design, um, but I mean in terms of the way we create narratives, uh, the way that we engage with the audience. We really have to come up with lots of new ideas because everyone else is. Everyone else in media and communications is coming up with wonderfully creative ideas. Look at Netflix. It was a creative idea uh, to make fantastic uh, TV series. But it was also very creative of Netflix in the way that they adapted their business model and the way that they serve their customers. So creativity, I think, is a really important one. The final one, because as Valia knows, I'm a deeply romantic kind of person, um, is this idea of emotion. And I won't go on too much about it, but if you go to my blog, I've, I've written about this. I've written a, a long journal article. Again, emotion was something that in journalism we tended to see as a bit of a kind of low-class thing. But I think it's absolutely vital, not just in terms uh, of human interest. I mean, human interest is important because if you're thinking about the public interest, well, the public are people. They're individuals. They have sex. They earn money. You know, they live real lives. They have pleasure. They have sadness. And increasingly, that is how they respond to journalism. They respond to it. In, they always have done, of course, but we didn't notice. But now we can see how they respond emotionally because they like something. Or we can see how much attention they pay. And most importantly, uh, they respond emotionally uh, when they share your journalism, when they recommend your journalism, when they decide to subscribe to your journalism. They're thinking emotionally. And by emotionally, I don't just mean happy, sad. I mean they're thinking about their personal identity. So for example, um, uh, Channel 4 News, where I used to work, has become phenomenally successful at creating video for mobile, um, uh, yeah, for video for mobile. And they have a formula uh, for this. Uh, uh, it's not a secret, but it's they, uh, there are three things they have to have in any kind of video. Uh, one of them, and they're all emotional, one of them is you've got to have emotional imagery. Somebody speaking passionately, sadly, aggressively about something. You know, you know, that emotional imagery or imagery that shocks or surprises or delights you, you know, fantastic pictures. The other one you have to have is social justice. That's partly because Channel 4 News is very much a public interest program, so that everything they produce for mobile video has to have something, there's something wrong with the world or something that needs changing, that there's some kind of action implied, some kind of politics involved with it, and it can be ethics, it doesn't have to be party politics. And the third uh, piece of it is personal identity. You should be, when you're creating this video, it can contain um, themes around personal identity, but also you're thinking of the identity, um, the realness, of the person who's consuming it. Simple things, are they a woman or not? You know, men like stories about women, but women especially like stories about women. So there's that sense of personal identity. Where do you live? Who are you? Where do you work? What kind of person are you? And so those kind of emotional factors are really important uh, in driving uh, people towards our journalism, and we should not be uh, frightened of being emotional. Just one last thing to end on. This is just an advert. Today, uh, this report was published. It's a report I wrote about uh, reporting on terrorism in the networked age. And a lot of the things I've just been speaking about um, come into very strong focus when you think about how we now get news about terrorism. It's an incredibly serious topic, um, but a load of those 
trends that I've been speaking about apply to that subject. So I hope you get a chance to read that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Beckett, uh, for the accurate way, actually, you summarize the whole, the whole situation of the media up now through these nine uh, contradictions. Very, very interesting, and I think that will be raise many questions about this. Uh, let's now proceed to Dr. Valia Kaimaki. Dr. Valia Kaimaki is a PhD holder in communication, media, and culture, and professional journalist. Uh, Valia was also the author of the first book about uh, web and, uh, media in Greek language. I think it's, uh, 19, was it was 1996, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Okay. So, and uh, Valia's uh, talk is about uh, uh, the need or not uh, to regulate uh, um, uh, the whole field of, uh, of, of, of blogging or social media and uh, this uh, latest uh, effort, the latest endeavor of the uh, Greek government to, uh, to, to, st to set up uh, this kind of regulation. So, Valia. I do. <laughs> I do it already. So you didn't go Tipo Damos. So I will uh, let this lovely young lady help me. It's it's kind of embarrassing. But I would, like to say, I would like to say hi to all of you and thanks for coming here. Uh, it's not really the center of Athens, so I know it's uh, maybe it was, it, it demanded a little bit more effort from you to come here than if it were, you know, right at the Sinegma Square. And I would like to uh, tell to my friend Charlie that the reason why he never understood Habermas and the public sphere is because he's English. And this is written specially for German and French people. I'm not sure that Greeks and Italian can understand it either. Well, a little bit better, but sorry, may maybe I solved one of your questions. Uh, what am I going to talk about uh, this afternoon? And I hope that our uh, foreign guests have my presentation in English, is uh, our new media, e-media, we call it registry which is a registry for online media. And uh, I'm, going, I'm mostly going to talk about two things. Why the government decided to do that, to take this initiative. And uh, it's, it's a kind of uh, rewarding initiative and not something obligatory. That means that uh, the ones who are going to be uh, members of the online registry are going to have for free um, a software for uh, uh, to check online who are who is stealing their using without authorization. Let's not say stealing their um, their their texts or images or whatever, and then they can even have access uh, to our uh, very old and very interesting. Uh, uh, archives of uh, audiovisual archives, mostly photographs and documents, but some uh, some uh, uh, videos as well. And third, and most interesting of all, they will be the ones who will be entitled to have state advertisement. And this uh, brings us to the need why we did that. And uh, let me switch to Greek and hope that my friends here will not be very annoyed. So I'm going to make it shorter than I intended because uh, Charlie was speaking so nicely and I didn't want to interrupt him. But <laughs> so what we're trying to do, that I can, I, can, I can tell you in English because you can see it written in Greek. So uh, what, are we go what the government is trying to do now, and more especially this, in this building, which is the General Secretariat for um, Media and Information, is to put uh, a kind of order 
in uh, what we call media regulation. So uh, we had two major bill bills that passed last year. One was the reopening of the national uh, radio television, which uh, probably all of you remember that was closed down by the previous government in June uh, 2013. And the second one was uh, 1339, Bill 13, uh, 4339, which was about uh, regulating uh, private TV channels and um, opening this, e this registry for online media. Uh, it also opened the way to the, um, to the regulation of radios and uh, what we also did outside these laws was, was to ask TV stations to pay the money they owed the state for years now. This is, uh, you, can, you can read, even, even the Greek readers, I've got in my blog, valiakaimaki.gr, I've got the whole speech as it should be, but I think now it's the opportunity just to give you more, informations, more information. Um, there was a system in Greece uh, 27 years ago, whoever had enough money to put an antenna on the highest mountain of Attica, Imitos, could have its own uh, private TV channel because there was no state regulation, so everybody could do whatever they wanted to. So for years, uh, the governments after that tried to regulate a little bit and give licenses, but uh, it couldn't be done for various, mostly political reasons that I'm not going to explain right now. Uh, but the thing is that they had the kind of agreement that they had provision, uh, TV licenses, and they had to pay some money for it. But this money was very rarely paid to the state. Why? Because there was another law that said that um, uh, during elections, uh, the the public has a right to um, uh, to be informed of what's happening to political parties and everything. So, uh, on the national TV, uh, you had these political spots, let's say, produced by political parties that uh, the national radio TV was obli obliged to, to to show, so that citizens would be really informed about what was happening uh, and what was the, 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 the program of the different parties. And uh, what um, after that, they, uh, the, the private TV channel said, why aren't we entitled to show all that? So we will do that and you will own us money. So we will, we own you money because we have, we have to pay for the frequencies. So Let's make it, what the government did was to ask the, the due for several years from private TV channels. So there was uh, some money that was uh, taken from it. And um, there was also an old uh, law that said that uh, the state should take 20% from the um, advertisement uh, uh, revenues of the private TV channels and we did that also. And now the next step would be, uh, will be a new bill, which will be presented in the parliament, hopefully by the end maybe of this month or early next month, that will regul that would provide an open platform for publicity, for TV, where there will be a kind of auction and everybody can see who is buying how much time in what channel and complicated stuff that I, I'm not sure I, uh, I can fully explain to you as I cannot fully understand because I'm a journalist and I'm not a TV advertisement market person. So uh, let's go back to our e-media. This is the kind of platform that you need to, to get inside and uh, uh, be part of it. Uh, what, what I thought I would talk to you about is uh, the, the digital news report of uh, 2016, who, who has numbers that um, uh, validate our first thoughts about the registry. And um, what we saw, but before that, let me tell you that we, from two different uh, 
um, studies of public opinion, we, we have seen repeatedly uh, for years that the, the, the liability of the, of the media in Greece was very, very, very low. And uh, to make things short, now we have, this is a, se a, se a second uh, study that shows th the question is which uh, institutions do you think are reliable? All right? So you have 60% responding that the, the most reliable institution is the army, and then the church, and then uh, you've got universities and. Uh, and the police, and the justice, and the president of the democracy, and uh, NGOs, and uh, mayors, and local councils, and uh, major Greek, um, major Greek um, uh, companies, and, uh, and then the government, and then the parliament, and then the political parties, and then you have the media with 18.2%. Uh, for the press and 17.2% for the um, uh, for the uh, TV, uh, and then you've got even lower than the media are only the banks. So uh, if you start, if you're in a country where people make are, are more confident, feel more confident towards the army than the media, then you do have some problems. I uh, I believe. So let's let's get back to um, to our uh, uh, Reuters Institute study. Well, this 55% that you see here is um, the uh, percentage of rich for um, for the press. This is 70 in Greece for the no that was for the broadcasters for the newspapers. And now you have 91 for digital born media, which is enormous. We, it would have been very interesting to have a study and see, to have the previous study include digital born media, because that was uh, two years ago and now things have greatly changed. But when you have 91% of, of reach for digital born online source type, that means that citizens are turning from traditional media institutions to new, let's say, I don't like the expression new media. So we have some examples here uh, for our students. I, I can invite you again to see the whole speech and the study. Uh, we've got news bomb, if I'm not mistaken, I can even read myself. And uh, we do have some older um, portals, news portals, such as in.gr that, in that, that, that keep their audiences. Yanis is here, and probably he was happy to see the study and see that he's, uh, he's high. And um, the thing is, in Greece, the public is being informed mostly by social media, and that's 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 the end of the story. Uh, so we are convinced that we did the right thing. We also had some uh, a few months ago. There was a, a major uh, scandal of uh, public uh, state advertising given to various blogs, news, online news sources with no name tag on them or stuff like that. There was, there was a major scandal and we, and there, there, are less, there, there are less major scandals that are around us every day. What, what's happening, it's happening mostly in Athens with big companies, with, uh, but in, in, uh, in uh, outside Athens, it's happening with uh, mayors and councils and uh, during the elections with uh, candidates for MPs. Uh, various blogs uh, ask them to, to give advertising or else they will start saying things about them. And most of them pay because 
I don't know. I don't have studies, but I do have some numbers um, showing the picture, the bigger picture, but not having enough details so that I can speak about them in, in public. So uh, the e-media is basically going to give state advertising to uh, um, to uh, online media that have name tags on them. Who is the person who owns the, the online media? Who? How many people are working for it? Are you just one person that's having fun? Are you someone who is working? Uh, uh, are you a journalist? Are you? What are you? Who are you? Who are you who wants to take state advertising? At the same time, as we have more and more people coming in because we started the registry um, uh, one and a half month ago, and now we have about two, uh, two, 350 um, online media who have already registered. So um, we hope that at the end of it, we will have a much clearer image of uh, who is behind the online media in Greece. And are they, are they media enterprises? Are they just individuals? Are they young people who are trying the, to, to, uh, to make a living by uh, forming their own startups? We, we will see all that. So uh, mapping, the, mapping the territory is one, uh, will be one good thing for the whole uh, uh, achievement. So uh, I, I don't want. I, I had. I, there is a video also that you can see online. Uh, it's not really the time to show it to you now because we're all very tired. But you can see how easy it is, and uh, the information needed to get to be a member of the online media is not something very, very important. It's just uh, the we we've got this this thing on news, newspapers had. Um, had the special sections where you could see who was the uh, editor, who was the, um, how do you call it, Charlie? Which no, uh, in, in French we call it ours, in the, on the press, when, you, when you've got the, the identity of the whole, who is the uh, editor-in-chief, who is the editor, who is chief of uh, sports, how do you call that, in newspapers, when you have that, all the names of the people who work there. Nobody remembers anymore. <laughs> In Greek, we call that identity. It's it's a box. It's a box that we call it. In in uh, in, in French, it's ours. Hmm? Uh, the credit is got you. Yeah. Got you. Yeah, but for a newspaper, you don't say credits. You say it's the credits. Well, but do you understand what I'm what I'm trying to say? So we will. Uh, so we will give the credits, and that's literal and metaphorical as well, to online media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valia. That was really very interesting. Uh, personally, I'm keeping the, the voluntary basis of this whole thing, actually, because I think that, uh, that, w that was the, the crucial point of the whole thing, the voluntary basis. So everyone who wants to get registered on this thing. Uh, uh, the last presenter is Ms. Selina McCree. is a professional journalist and co-founder of the web platform Ecomedia.com, an innovative project which aims to increase the global collaboration of journalists overcoming the borders barrier, in, which I suppose that you, uh, your talk is about. So, Elena? Thank you. So, as I'm the last speaker, I have to keep you awake. Um, so my name is Elina, I'm a freelance journalist and actually I think I'm one of the few Greeks in the panel that I'm not a professor of university. I have never worked for a big media outlet and actually I'm an outsider in Greece. And uh, my family, my professional family is a tech company. <laughs> so not so many things in common. And I'm a little bit heretic. Um, <coughs> I believe I'm one of you, if you, are, or if you are some of you students, I'm one of you. I'm, uh, I'm a person that belongs in the less privileged generation of journalists. Less privileged in terms of money, security, working conditions, 
but I have more than ever the possibility to work in multiple countries and with many, many great tools to work with. Now, I'm a little bit heretic because I believe less and less in the big brands, in the big media outlets, in the institutions that house or housed until today journalistic work. And uh, I'm happy that I meet all around Europe young people that I, they are very reluctant to work for them. Of course, they don't pay very well today and they, again, the working conditions are very bad, but they don't want to work with them in terms of service. They doubt a lot the kind of service they provide into, into communities. I will not speak about only about Greece, but I will speak about the, on a European level because it's the market I claim to know best. And we have seen during the crisis and a little bit before the crisis that clearly media institutions failed a lot in their mission. They failed in the mission to serve democracy and they failed also to serve the public interest, the common public interest, which is of course is very, very hard to define what is it. And this was not only for the tabloids that most people say, okay, they are the, tablo the tabloids that failed the public interest, but that there are very serious newspapers. I would say that they, we had uh, very, very bad reporting. We can, of course, most of you, you know, the media crisis between Germany and Greece. We have seen the worst of it. You are Nazis. No, you are la uh, lazy people. But also right now with the Brexit, it was another case. I've heard from British colleagues that I don't know, Charlie, if this uh, percentage I will give is correct. 80% of the audience of the print um, uh, of the print press was in fa was in papers in favor of the Brexit. Is it too is it too high? Like Daily Mirror or uh, yes, yeah. so the, the newspapers? Yes, but the audience 80% of the audience was for this uh, for this medium media that never explain what was this decision about. And now I come to the question of this panel, did the institutional media, the legacy media we're talking about, the big brands, protect it and still protect the public interest? I highly doubt about it. Of course they direct the public, uh, the public opinion, but do you think they, uh, they are players into politics or they are observers? Again, thank God, in my travels around Europe, I see more and more people, that the young people, they are trying to find their fate outside of the legacy media, and they are creating their project. And if there's something I can tell you is really, I would encourage you, it's, it's the path I took to create my own projects, is to really be creative and find your way outside of the legacy media. Again, it's very easy to say that because right now the business model has collapsed and uh, they don't pay very well. But we witness also something else, that legacy media have many limits, not geographical limits, limits of mind. And that for a younger generation, these kind of limits mean little. Uh, my, if, I, if I speak from my experience with the Greek media, I had to always live with the politicians. Well, if you work in Greece, as most of you, you know, it's like if you are a journalist, you have to follow always the politicians. What they did, what they said, who they met. It's like, are they only these people, the public interest? Again, for the Greek people, have you ever been exposed to the debates and the discussion of other European countries. We are members of this union and we n almost never discuss about the debates of other societies. Again, I will take the Brexit example because uh, the Greek crisis is a very, um, very common, uh, common topic uh, discussed everywhere in Europe, but I will take something that it is outside of our problem. We constantly knew what Cameron was saying and was, uh, who was meeting about uh, the referendum or the plebiscite, to be more correctly, but we never heard in Greece or in France or in Germany the real debate of the people, of the British people. And in that case, if the British people knew what the Greeks are thinking about their problem, maybe they would say that, you see, the problem is deeper than what I thought. 
And we see that legacy media again and the institutional media, I doubt that, uh, I don't agree that um, BuzzFeed is an institution. It's not yet an institution as um, America is not uh, yet civilization, it will become. <laughs> Uh, it's too recent. Uh, we see that they are struggling to survive and they hang over impatiently over technology. And what I see everywhere when, when finance is allowed, they copy the superior digital formula coming from the United States. And right now, with uh, we all know that all news right now is global, especially right now in Europe, that they see that our problems are common. They use machine learning and artificial intelligence in order to translate faster articles and attract more audience, but they lack the something very, very important, the consciousness, the European consciousness on reporting, why we need to report on other countries. Um, again, I'm saying that I'm taking the European, uh, the European uh, example because imagine that it is 66% uh, bigger than the American one, fragmented, but it's a very big market and it's, we have here common, common problems. Um, mm, 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 what else? And I have witnessed also that journalists are behind evolutions. Life evolves in Europe tremendously fast. We have a, an Erasmus generation. We have common laws many years now. It's just that journalists realize it now. I remember I have seen a, a presentation from Nikolai Nelsinki, and he was stating a very, very, very well targeted example. There was some years ago this, uh, the horse meat scandal. Do you remember it? I don't think it touched a lot. Uh, the horse meat scandal. This scandal touched several countries. But because there was this discrony on reporting, the journalists were not looking what was happening in the other countries. You know, are we sure that all the people that were responsible for this scandal went to prison? But the laws are common in Europe. This horse meat traveled. Uh, freely, but press is fragmented. Um, so what I'm saying from all, all this is that I clearly defend that we need to change the way we report. We need more networked media, and uh, God, the 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 way they function, the institutions, the institutional media, this hierarchy, this way of functioning is is like a nightmare. I would say. And they fail to give, to shed some light on the complexity of discussions, of today's discussions, not to mention the European discussions that are very, very complex. Um, there are several, several, I will, I, I will just finish right now, just uh, to give you some hints. We don't, I, I really, really defend that we need more network media. That's why I created a network. I clearly doubt if we need the editors where they are, we need, if we really need all those managers. What does it mean a foreign correspondent within Europe? Can you really tell me the foreign correspondent of Reuters or of Associated Press is doing in Greece the same work as the, as the Spiegel correspondent? That his country is affected more on what is happening in Greece than an American press agency? so many, or do we really need in Europe, again, a network media, someone who corresponds in, he's based in Athens, but he corresponds in a unilateral relationship in an office in London? Does this help the complexity of discussions in Europe? Of course, we have some networks and associations of media like LENA, but I doubt, I clearly doubt if you can teach an old horse a new kind of walking. And again, do you think, have you ever thought if you really need this expertise of the brand? I remember my father always bought a Cathimerini. He chose to look the world and through the eyes of Cathimerini. And now he's saying to me, you are fri your friends on Facebook is your circle and this is only the way you get news. And I, I, I fight back, you know. When you choose to see all your life news and the world through the Cathimerini or the Earth uh, angle, isn't that too limiting for, you, for the world and your world? This is just things to, to discuss about and think about. I don't think we really need, we need today proxies of personality or identity. And 
media and big brands acted like that for many, many years. Mm, I, I believe, of course, in my profession, and I believe that people will still need to learn why something is happening in the world. So we will continue to need journalists. But this fourth estate, I really, really doubt where is going to be housed journalism, the way the form is going to be made, and even the essence. And I was discussing before that sometimes I feel like in Greece and in other southern countries, that journalists, the traditional journalist is becoming a little bit like the shoemaker, something that it's becoming a little bit obsolete. So it's, it's a big, big um, an urgent need to evolve and really to do something better for our, for, uh, for our profession. And I think internet and network media help a lot. We don't see those kind of media yet in Europe. <laughs> Thank you, Elena, for your very straightforward and passionate presentation about your work. So, uh, questions? doesn't uh, feel, does, we don't have the result that uh, we were uh, aiming at. So, um, you know, these are some thoughts that how, or if it's possible to avoid all that, and how do we do that, and, you know, just to make things more complicated for you here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes. <laughs> Everything you say is true, although I think I think you are, and it's a good thing to be, but I think you're expecting too much in that when I'm talking about creativity, for example, 
I'm not saying that journalists should become artists. There is a difference. I'm talking about perhaps it's more of a kind of craft of creativity in the sense that you, you should think about design. You should think about the formula that you're adopting. So I'll give you one example, the, you know, the, the BuzzFeed, you know, the list, whatever my list was, nine things. That's creative. You can say very serious things in a list. The list is a very effective way of creating a format that people like um, for all sorts of good reasons. Now, if all you ever do is lists, then it stops being creative, it becomes boring. So BuzzFeed are doing lots of different things. They're desperately trying to find different ways and they're being very creative about it. So I think on the sort of creative bit, you, you shouldn't, I'm not, um, what's the word? I'm not, I'm not talking about that you should become artists. I think it's, it's the craft. Um, on the other bit about emotions and sensationalism, I think the sensationalism thing um, is just as old as journalism itself. The very act of journalism is sensationalist. It's saying, hey, pay attention to this. So in a way, I think that's a boring point. I don't mean to be rude, but in the sense that, of course, anything can be sensationalist. But what drives it is not um, the emotions particularly of the journalism. The emotions are already out there. People already feel emotional about issues and topics and stories. It's how you curate those emotions. I'm not saying that you should be much more emotional. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that you should just understand the role that emotion plays. And the emotions, you know, can be, um, it can be, as I say, about personality or identity. It's not always about love or hate. Um, although social media shows us how angry people are and also how excited they can be about things. Uh, and the, the, the point about the limits on that, are, are, I mean, your, your point about the island, Kurdi, is that his name? Yeah. The boy, the Turkish boy. Funny enough, I've just been writing about that today. I'm going to lecture about it next week. Um, the point is, yes, it had an enormous consciousness-raising effect, briefly. And do you know what? Loads of refugees are still, being, are still dying. Now, I don't want, actually, to live in a world where journalists can change the world like that. That would be a terrible thing, because journalists are not elected. We're not democratic. Uh, there are limits on, on media, and in a way that's a good thing. Change should come through, certainly the first requirement is, is knowledge and consciousness, but change should come through politics. It's about power and money. It shouldn't be because you've seen an upsetting photo. That shouldn't change the course of history in itself. So in that sense, I am less cynical about you know, the strange effects. I mean, the Turkish boy, for example, there was a lot of hostile commentary as well. So in a, in a, in a good way, it created a debate, you know, and focused people's minds. Hello, my name is uh, Yanis Mandalidis from Indochir. My question is uh, to Professor Beckett. Uh, I would ask him to be more uh, like a fortune teller and uh, tell us uh, what uh, is uh, his estimation, um, what he thinks uh, about the future of uh, a professional journalist. I mean, uh, is he just a curator or uh, the person who verifies uh, the information coming from uh, social media? Is, he, uh, is his role more uh, investigative? What, uh, what uh, the future for us? Um, she is... Um all those things, but I wouldn't use the word just. When you said just a curator, my God, curating is much, much harder than old-fashioned journalism. Old-fashioned journalism was great. You saw something, ping, off it goes. That's quite easy in a way, but to be a curator, you have to understand your audience, you have to understand the story, you have to understand how the story is going to change, the different platforms, the creativity, the role of emotion. It's a much more complicated job, much harder to do. 
Um, and likewise, when you say what is you know, the journey is going to be, well, again, I think you, you, you gave a little list. She's going to be many of those things. Sometimes it's going to be one journalist who has to be able to do different things. Um, but I think increasingly we are going to see a more specialised and more expert, better journalists. And that is simply because the journalists who produce the kind of boring, easy journalism, and I used to do a lot of that, you know, um, the kind of routine stuff. Like I said, you know, the computer can do that. Um, somebody in Singapore can do that. You don't need to have a journalist typing up the football results anymore. A lot of it's going to become automated. So I think it's a, a fantastic opportunity that it, I personally think it's much more interesting to be a kind of multi-dimensional network journalist. It's fascinating. And it's quite hard work, as somebody pointed out earlier. You know, have you got the time to do it? Uh, yes, you should, by having the right priorities and, uh, you know, by shifting the resources in the newsroom, uh, ma making choices. So I think it's, it's going to be a whole range of things. And a lot of the people, I'm really bored, by the way, of the is he a journalist debate or is she a profession or not. I think that's so boring um, because so many people are going to be doing journalism. You know, university, as I said, university academics will now blog and they'll now write articles. And they're probably better at it than journalists used to be for some stories, you know, and obviously increasingly, you know, people are accidental journalists, you know, they witness something and they put it on social media. So I think uh, journalism is going to become much more diverse, I hope. It's got to, because it's got to be able to be on all these different platforms and because people's lives have always been much more diverse than journalism. And we're only discovering that now. And I think journalism has to be much more part of uh, people's lives to answer the question. Just uh, one remark. Uh, of course, most of you must have seen it today, but even if someone hasn't seen it, we've been trending retreat conference 2016 has been trending third since this morning. We went a little bit slower uh, because of our lunch, but then we went up again, and we are closing third trade in the country also. So there are many people tweeting and retweeting what's happening here. And I, will, I especially want to, to thank all the people from the General Secretariat that worked here. Lena is over there, and she's tweeting for us. And uh, there are more people inside the, the glasses, the, 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 the Yes, they're waving. Hi. And there, of course, there were so many, 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 many that you didn't see or didn't notice, but they worked very hard for this to be, uh, to be real. And of course, uh, this is a separate team, and we also have to thank Sophia's team that made this uh, possible for today. For them, that's for them, for all that work. Excuse me. Um, tomorrow we're going to start at 10 o'clock uh, with a net with uh, with a workshop um, about data journalism, uh, and the program will will continue as uh, as possible. Okay. So uh, uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow, uh, and here. Okay. So I think that everybody, we got a, a lot of uh, food for thought for tonight, actually, after all, we've heard the witness here. Okay, good night. <laughs>